Hi, I'm Niall O'Carroll, and this is Inertia Creeps. Hey, Paul, how you doing, man? Great, Neil. Great to see you. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, always a pleasure to chat. Something I've been very fortunate to get to do quite often. So uh, it's nice to um, to record one for a change because usually we get through some some quality gems. So I'm sure today will be a good one. Um, um, I suppose to start with, we'll we'll talk a little bit about um, the the remarkable career you've had so far. Um, just to give people context, um, I'm not sure how many books you've written at this stage, but um, maybe you'd like to share with the audience just uh, some context on your philosophies around trust and your academic and writing career and everything else that is that forms the wonderful world of Paul Zak. Um, thanks. Yeah, I'm a behavioral neuroscientist. I run a laboratory and, and I'm a professor at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California and a uh, four-time startup guy. Uh, so my current company is called Immersion Neuroscience that allows anybody to measure what the brain loves in real time by applying algorithms in the cloud to data we pull from smartwatches and fitness wearables. Um, the goal there is to create better experiences for customers, for uh, learners, for our students, uh, for uh, entertainment. Um, you've seen this, Neil, right? Uh, a lot of the experiences we have mm -hmm. are just not that good. And I think that's for want of appropriate measurement. Just asking people they like something is different than saying, does this shake up my brain so much that I not only enjoy it yes. now, but I remember it. I want to do it over and over. You know, think of all the classes you and I have been in where, gosh, you know, the professor, mm -hmm. teacher just puts you to sleep. And you're like, dude, how, how is this possible that you, yeah. you're an expert in this <laughs> field, but you can't actually deliver that information in a really effective way that sticks in your brain? Yeah, of course it does. And it's, do you know what, what really draws me to this is, um, you know, the work I did in sport and the work I did, particularly like when you're talking about mindset and, and psycho psychological performance and all this kind of stuff that it's very easy for a strength conditioning coach to measure the output of their work. Their athletes, their muscles get bigger, they get faster, you know, whatever. It's very easy for a nutritionist to point to an improvement in, in body shape or whatever. Um, it's easy for a skills coach to point to the, the development of skills and they can, they can measure how the skills are working and all that kind of stuff. But it was all, it's always been very difficult for a psychologist to be able to say that I did this work and that part, that athlete is better because we did this work. Because the only real evidence you had was anecdotal. And as we know, science is, you know, like the, 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 the proof of science is very robust and anecdotal evidence doesn't carry the same weight as, uh, as say, empirical data. So it's kind of like understanding I found it very frustrating at times because you would have athletes saying that I am better because I did this work, but the evidence would be, yeah, but they also trained harder and they ate better and they picked up their skills, you know, so there are other reasons why their performance improved. So what I love about what you're doing and, and where I came on board with you at the beginning was in the concept of measuring trust. And what immersion does and what I really love about it is, I mean, you guys are, are moving into a world where you're talking about measuring trust, engagement, psychological safety, which are things which would have traditionally been seen as being kind of notional. There, there are things that are going on in your head, not necessarily physical things you can measure. So you guys have done some incredible work and, and your research over the years has really challenged from a neuroscience point of view, has really challenged people to think about how we interact with each other in a different way. And, 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 and obviously, I'm a huge believer from a corporate world point of view that relationships are at the key of great leadership. So relationships are built on foundations of trust, right? So uh, there's a lot there to unpack, but basically, let's talk about immersion and the work you're doing. And we can talk about um, Tuesday, which is not a uh, reference to a day of the week, but to the app you guys have. Maybe talk to me a little bit about the work you're doing and how you're using those fundamentals of measuring trust and measuring psychological safety and delivering something that's actually concrete and, and, and measurable. So I totally agree with what you said, that leadership is about relationships. 
today, I think the old fashioned view of leadership was very top down hierarchical. So many people have said it, but the war for talent is over. Talent is won. We're running out of babies, right? So there, you know, the number of people working is just fewer and fewer. So we've got to keep those people physically healthy and emotionally healthy. And then from a leadership perspective, we've got to really think about how to create emotionally safe workplaces where people are challenged. They do have trust in their colleagues and they can perform at their best and get the satisfaction from doing something difficult, uh, but important and valuable. Um, so, um, how do we do that? So again, you and I have talked many times now, so we all agree on this, but you know, put humans together, we're social creatures. We, we can congregate very nicely, but that can generate friction. So I think of trust as a lubricant. When I trust the people around me, then I don't have to micromanage them. I don't have to guess whether you're going to fulfill your project or not. You're very reliable. And that trust in the brain is built on the same foundations for all kinds of relationships, friendships, romantic relationships. So um, in some sense, you have to love the people you work with in the philia sense. You have to care about them. If they care about you, then you have this strong relationship, which facilitates greater trust, better cooperative work, um, more productive workplaces and more satisfaction. So how do I differentiate between the friction that humans will have, which I call a lack of psychological safety and the trust, the connection, the attachment to them. And so, yeah, we, we built this, uh, software platform, uh, we mean, uh, immersion neuroscience that allows people to measure those two dimensions of that. Therefore, from a leadership perspective, I can understand whether I'm creating an effective workplace, low friction, most of the time and high immersion. So immersion is this measure of the metabolic investment I'm making in the tasks I'm doing. And those tasks often are with other people. But um, if I'm not invested in that uh, relationship, if that doing that task, then my performance falls, doesn't feel good. I'm just kind of going through the motion. So from the coaching perspective, Neil, there's like right in your world, right? So mm -hmm. as a leader, I want to coach you. I want to motivate you towards better performance, um, growing professionally and getting the personal benefit of that professional growth. But to do that, I've got to know where you are on that growth curve, right? So if I'm training you to be a better swimmer, I've got to push you go, Hey, you're out of breath. You got to do 10 more laps. What? I'm out of breath. I don't want to mm -hmm. do right. So I'm going to coach you because I have a lot more experience perhaps or knowledge and give you the opportunity to really perform and improve your, your, uh, experience. So again, it's a win-win space here. This is not exploiting employees so that companies make more money. It's giving employees a chance to really shine, to own what they're doing and get the satisfaction from that, which benefits the employee, but also produces higher productivity and lower turnover for the organization. It's something that, 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 uh, as you say, that the, the kind of the definition, our understanding of leadership is changing dramatically in relation to the new generation of workers who are, you know, one thing I've learned, I, I, I actually was having conversations recently with, um, a guy who's, uh, very senior in McDonald's and obviously McDonald's would have a, uh, traditionally have a very young workforce. So they've got a lot of youngsters coming out of school, coming into their workforce. Their managers would be quite young. But what was really interesting was that managers who are like 24, 25, um, are, are not equipped to deal with the kids who are coming out of school now because the kids coming out of school now, even in the space of five, six years of a difference generationally, they're coming out of school very comfortable talking about their mental health, very comfortable talking about their emotional well-being. And the managers have no clue what to do. Where do I even start with this? Like a kid is coming to me telling me that they're struggling with their mental health. The hell do I do with that? So the kind of idea of, of, of leaders in companies and in the corporate world understanding trust and engagement and immersion and all these different terms um, is really radically different to what we've known before. So from your perspective, like with the, with the work you guys do, right. And, 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 and the research behind this stuff is fascinating. Um, and like, there's like, you know, it, there's very robust science to back up what you guys are doing, that it's not just this, what gets dismissed as us, oh, just the, the latest kind of fad or whatever. Like, I mean, you, you've been doing this for 20 odd years and you know, you, you know, your you know, your subject better than anyone I know, but when you're kind of in the, when you're dealing with the 
the business world and in the business context. And if somebody is slightly dismissive of this, how do you kind of communicate your message so they understand that immersion and even just the basic science that you guys are working on is kind of essential to the success of our, our, our the, the future well-being of the company as well as the people? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't think I have the perfect answer. I'd love your feedback as well. I think, you know, if we look at um, the factors that cause people to quit their jobs or even for that matter, uh, get ill, it's not money. It's usually the people factor. So these quote soft skills are actually the hardest ones, at least for a lot of us. It certainly is for me, right? So how do I effectively motivate my team, um, give them challenges, coach them to be successful, but at the same time, not push them so hard that they're, hey, coming to work, they don't want to talk to me, right? So to me, again, that's a measurement issue. Um, when we go back to the larger picture of kind of health and happiness, um, you know, the things that are primarily inducing a lot of uh, pathology today, both in the healthcare system, costs, um, loss, sick days, turnover, are mental health issues. And so we've got to get ahead of this. So I think from a leadership perspective, I want to be acutely aware of the emotional states of my employees and do check-ins. I call these emotional check-ins. Great. And I think that's a good, a good uh, leadership approach. But more generally, I think once you have measurement, you've got to think about how to keep people emotionally fit. So I use the word fitness and not wellness. Wellness is like a zero one variable to me, but emotional fitness is something you can develop. So that means work-life integration. It means having autonomy, having locus of control. So all these things that employees really want and often are facilitated with hybrid work uh, are essential to keep people emotionally fit. Otherwise, again, I'm going to quit, go work someplace else or do remote work or be a gig worker. Right? There's lots and lots of options now. So if I want people in the office, which I think is important at least you know two, three days a week, I've got to create the office as a social emotional hub where interesting people are doing cool stuff and it's fun to go in. Yeah, I got to commute. I get it. But, you know, that commute is also bookending your day, right? So um, I remember speaking to a very senior person at Accenture, uh, one of our longtime users of the software, and she said, you know, what I don't like, this is during the lockdown, what I don't like working at home is that, I, you know, usually I commute in the train in to New York City and then I commute out and I use that commute time to listen to a podcast or a book. And it's kind of my preparatory time for the next, you know, phase of my day. And when you're working at home, sometimes you just keep working and working and working. So again, I think we want to modulate that so that people have control over their schedules. If I want to take an hour off and go pick up my kid from school or whatever, I can do that and make up the other hour, you know, after dinner or whatever that is. But at the same time, if you can create that social emotional hub where you want to be in the office, then you get those random collisions. We talked about relationship building. I can run into you like we, we scheduled this deal, right? So we did some chit chat before we started recording. But if you're in the office together, probably a couple times during the day because we like each other, we would talk about movies or <laughs> whatever, right? And then you start talking about work and you, you facilitate greater um, trust. You build that relationship with other people. So um, I'm a big believer that as social creatures, we need to be together. And that's testable using the, the Tuesday app to see, am I creating frictions? When, when I want everyone to be in the office on Wednesday for our all hands meeting, is there friction or is there trust? And again, now that's measurable objectively, passively. And if not, then I, as a leader, have to think about, well, why do people only want to come in on Wednesdays and work at home the rest of the week? Is it not exciting enough? And by the way, for listeners, I'm a big believer in cheating in every possible way that's legal. So uh, if you want people on <laughs> Fridays, have pizza and beer at five o'clock. I don't know, you know, get people back into that swing mm -hmm. of things because there's a lot of value to actually being together. And for me, I go in the office a couple of days a week. It's so fun to go in. They're my people, right? They're all the people I work with for a long time and you get some new employees and they get some fresh ideas and it's so much fun to be in the office. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's important. I think we got a little off track, Neil. Bring me back to where you want to go. No, no, I'm loving this, man. Just keep going with that. That's that's exactly it. Maybe maybe kind of uh, maybe just kind of some concept context for people on understanding how immersion measures trust and how how do you 
measure that in the brain? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'd shown from work from my academic lab starting in the early 2000s that a neurochemical called oxytocin is a key signal that somebody around you appears to be safe or trustworthy. Uh, and we showed that, in fact, the more you are so someone you you're, you trust them, the more their brain releases oxytocin and the more they want to reciprocate. So this is the really the neurologic foundation for working in teams, right? If, if I don't, I'm, again, this is all unconscious, deep in the brainstem, outside of conscious awareness. If I'm getting these unconscious signals of fear, right, that's the balancing factor for trust. Like, I don't know what's going on, but I have just, again, maybe I can't articulate it, but my brain knows. Um, so we've done, we've done a lot of experiments, Neil, on, for example, on lying. So we gave people a big incentive to lie because we put like $500 on the table. And so, hey, talk to this person. You can share this money or not, but you're going to do it sequentially. And when people lie, sorry, healthy, psychologically healthy people, not psychopaths, they get a, a big uh, uh, stress response, right? We see their palm sweat. We can measure this physiologically. So most people who are healthy will lie, but they they feel bad about it later. They have this, this they have tells, right? And so we pick up unconsciously on those tells. Same thing with trust. When someone is trustworthy, they're making eye contact, they're relaxed, everything that you're picking up from them says, hey, this person's going to work. Um, you know, um, they're going to cooperate. They're going to do what they say they're going to do. And then I'm happy to put in my effort as well, because I think you're going to, you know, do the same. So, so originally we measured oxytocin using blood draws, uh, gets released in the brain, but also released in the peripheral blood. Um, over time, we traced out these pathways that capture the impact of oxytocin on the cranial nerves. These are the brain's output file. And those cranial nerves uh, pass through the heart. And so it affects the rhythms of the heart very subtly. So we don't measure heart rate or heart rate variability, but it's a higher order uh, factor. So it's all published scientific research, but in short, it gives leaders a platform to look at all employees who want to opt in and have their anonymized data shared with their, um, with their supervisors, a snapshot of whether my, uh, organization has high friction or high trust, whether it's we're forming relationships or working effectively together or not. And you can differentiate this by different locations. So if my San Diego location is doing great, hey, what's going on in San Diego and Kansas City? Not so much. Right. So that's when you want to do interventions and, you know, identify best practice. If San Diego is the highest immersion, high uh, emotional fitness, what are they doing besides the sunshine? What are they doing in San Diego that, you know, we can replicate? So, yeah, I'm a cheap guy. You know, I'm a business owner, so I'm a cheap bastard. And so I just <laughs> want to, you know, find this practice and copy it. I don't want to recreate the wheel. I just want to copy the wheel that someone else has yeah. already made. And and do you find that culture is the influencer of trust or can ch trust change the culture? Oh, what a good question. I think it's bi-directional, but I'd love your feedback as well. So... Um, so let, let's be, be clear for the listener. So culture is the set of implicit norms of behavior that people, um, experience or, or uh, exhibit every day. And so it's not those explicit rules, it's the implicit rules, how we get along, the clothing we wear, um, whether we shake hands. There's a famous, uh, story related to one of my previous books, um, uh, called Trust Factor about when, uh, Lenovo, the giant uh, um, Chinese PC manufacturer or PC knockoff, uh, purchased uh, the the um, IBM brand. So it's a big deal, right? So they went from being the second largest PC producer to the largest. And the CEO of that company, which is again, very Chinese, very hierarchical, everyone called him, you know, your, your most honorific chairman of our company. You know, they'd have to bow when they saw him. <laughs> And he realized, oh, if we're going to be a global company, we can't have just sort of Chinese values. We have to have more general values. So he spent a week greeting all day or in the morning, greeting every employee that came in with just a, a shirt, no, no tie, no sport coat, and said, hey, everyone, we're going to use our first names. And actually, they started using English as their default language, even in the Chinese headquarters. So again, is that horizontalizing, if that's a word, of that organization where, look, we're all pulling together. We're all doing something important. Another example is uh, Jim Senegal, the founder of Costco, a uh, great guy. 
And, you know, he would wear that short sleeve white shirt with a name tag that said Jim. He'd be in the stores a couple days a week, every week, moving boxes, talking to customers, checking people out. He knew how his business ran because he was on the front lines. So if you're a hourly employee at Costco or you're a guy putting computers together uh, at Lenovo and you see the boss on the line with you helping out and you can talk to him or her and say, hey, here's what's really going on. Think of the deep knowledge you have, but what a great leadership mm -hmm. approach to be there to show that we're all in this together. So takeaways, uh, horizontal structures uh, from a management perspective generally have higher trust, lower turnover, um, uh, greater employee job satisfaction um, because I can see what's going on. I can communicate clearly. So even if you run a big organization, um, a executive friend of mine, you said his name was Jerry. You said this thing monthly called Juice with Jerry. You put your name in a in a hat, and he because he was a healthy, super healthy guy. So it wouldn't be coffee with Jerry; it would be Juice with Jerry. And you go to a juice bar, and you get about fifteen employees, and just sit down for an hour, and you know, complain, uh, promote yourself, you know, whatever you want to do. You got an hour with a CEO. This is a, a actually a very large tech company. I'm not going to mention the name. Uh, just to protect my friend. But uh, Juice with Jerry was a brilliant idea. And again, couldn't do it with everybody, but FaceTime with a boss. Awesome. I know who this dude is. And now am I going to be a slacker at work? No, I just talked to Jerry, right? He's he's in there. He wants us to be successful and he wants to cheerlead us. He wants to coach us towards that success. Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny because the the that an idea that's become kind of outdated and outmoded and whatever was the the whole suggestion box in the company or, you know, leave your suggestions here to make this company better. And it, it, it kind of ran, it became unfashionable because nobody ever took it particularly seriously and suggestion would go into the box and never see the light of day again. But what if, and I always thought about this from, from some of the companies I've worked with that like, what if you had a suggestion box where once a month you had this is the best suggestion we've had this month. And then the CEO calls out that employee for their great suggestion. And there's a kind of like a celebration or, or the employee gets a chance to sit with the CEO or whatever the case may be, right? You're automatically telling everyone in the company that they can shape the direction the company's going and you're recognizing individuals. You know, um, there's, there's that, that great line in The Simpsons where Mr. Burns, there used to be kind of like a standard thing where every time Mr. Burns would see Homer Simpson, he'd go, who... Who the hell is that? Like, and Smetters, he's right. And man would say, "Oh, that's one of your drones from Sector C." <laughs> and uh, I love the idea that Homer was one of the drones. But it's the, but that's kind of the, the faceless individual who's working on your factory line or whatever. And what power would it have if that faceless person was actually recognized and called out in name? And I think that Juice of Jerry thing is a great idea. Yeah, from from a trust building perspective, you know. Um recognizing high performers not only motivates that individual, but when it's done publicly, when it's done, when that individual or team meets or sees a goal, then there's this positive feedback loop because we all like to be recognized. Even the introverts, even the shy people like to be recognized. So say, Neil, wow, you know, you finished this three month project and that Monday at our all hands meeting, I'm like, Hey, Neil was killed, kicked ass. Tell us about it. And I'm going to give you something, you know, that I know you like, I'm looking for a prop, you know, I'm going to give you some, Hey, here's some nice Bose headphones because I know you work in a noisy office and um, you're awesome, man. Tell us how you did it. So now I get give you the stage as a leader. I have done this hundreds of times, Neil. And every time the, the leader of some group that is being recognized will say, well, we did this and that, but we is a keyword. And then Bob did this and then Susan, we had this huge problem. Susan built us out. So now we're talking about how this team has cohered, right? How we've actually solved problems together. So when we do this publicly, we set these aspirations for everyone to be recognized. So recognition is so cheap. Even if you're buying, I don't know what these cost, 300 bucks. But if I'm buying you a coffee card or muffins or whatever, that, that manifestation that I understand that you went over and above to make this thing happen, right? That's what I want everyone to feel like. Again, not every day. We have days where we're tired and just we're just kind of going through. And that's okay. Right. Everyone, everyone can't perform at their best every day. Even Olympic athletes that you know, Neil, have bad days. Right. Yeah. So things happen. But if I can set the expectation that as a team, we're doing something important for the world, we're doing with people that we really trust and we care about, 
then you have this high performance organization. And by the way, size matters here mm. too. Uh, companies like W.R. Gore and others have kind of capped the size of an office at a, between 115 and 200. Um, Enterprise Rent-A-Car has done this, right? When when you get too many people, again, you lose that horizontal structure. So then spin out and make another office, mm -hmm. right? And have a uh, you know another person running that office. So um, I have some tips, you know, that I picked up over the years to make these teams more effective. Yeah, and it, it's it's funny. I mean, gratitude is such a powerful tool, and I, I find that I, I often have a conversations. Um, I, I deliver talks and stuff where I talk about. Uh, uh, I always talk about building sustainable habits, not not just good habits, but sustainable. Like because, you know, the diet industry is set up in such a way that it's a billion dollar industry because it's designed to fail. Because the, the the whole principle of the diet industry is you deny yourself everything you love for a period of time to lose weight, but to what end? You know, and 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 once you've get to the end of that period of time, the first thing you're going to do is go back to all the things you love, right? So how do you create habits that are sustainable that will keep you going over a long period of time? And one of the key elements of that is that you have to enjoy doing it. What we, what we enjoy, what we, uh, what we reward, we repeat. So we'll keep doing something if we get re rewards from it. And for me, like a big thing over here, I don't know if you guys have it, but we have this uh, thing they call dry January, which is after Christmas, everybody takes the month of January and they stop drinking. And it's like this big health kind of thing, right? And usually it's kind of because Christmas wasn't that healthy and there's like a, a, a hungover reaction to it. But I take it as kind of something a little bit different because the principle of dry January is you don't have a drink for the whole month of January, which means that when you get to the end of the month of January, you've either succeeded or failed. And if you had, just say there's a family wedding happens in the middle of the month or there's a family celebration and you have a glass of wine, your, your mental reaction to doing that is that you're a failure because you couldn't even last the month of January. And I have this thing I talk about, I put it on the wall, it's the creating the chain where you get the 31 days of January as a calendar page on the wall and you give yourself an X for every day you don't have a drink if that's what you're doing, right? And then at the end of the month, you go back and you look at the calendar. And in that instance of that story I told you, you've got 30 days with an X and one day without it, which means you've had 30 days of being healthier than you, uh, you know, than you were before. So that's a good thing to do, right? That's something to celebrate. That's not something to beat yourself up over. But then it's about, well, can I can continue that into February? And maybe it's a thing that I'm not going to have it. I'll, I'll have a drink on a Friday evening after, uh, you know, at the end of a week, I might have a glass of wine with dinner. You might decide I don't need it. But what it does then is it challenges you to think about why did you want to do dry January or why did you want to lose weight? And, you know, you, once you start to explore your actual motivation, like people think that people go on diets and it's purely and simply to lose weight, but it's not. People go on diets because they have self-esteem issues. Their, their internal dialogue is really, really horrible to themselves. There's a whole kind of, you know, there's a whole narrative that I'm abnormal, I'm different. And they want to change that dialogue. And part of changing that dialogue is how they look, but more of it is how they feel. So anyway, all of that is my little rant. But what it is, is it's, it's, it's the same principles of, you know, for me, I mean, in that case, like building sustainable trust is about our building sustainable habits is about creating something where you trust yourself and you have, you know, your, your, your inner internal voice is actually at one with what you're doing. Because what we do internally, if, if you ask somebody how they would speak to a best friend going through whatever situation they're going through, it will never be the same as how we speak to ourselves. We will be kind to other people, we'll be horrendously hard on ourselves. So Allowing for all of that, and I mean, obviously, I'm going back to what I started this rant about was about rewarding, you know, if we reward something, we repeat it. But the key element of rewarding stuff, and what I find really fascinating about your research is the, the line you have drawn from trust to productivity and how you can prove or you have proven that people working in high trust environments um, it's not just productivity, but there's like less, less uh, absenteeism, there's less sick days, there, there's more engagement in, in, in the company culture, there's more productivity, obviously, and performance has improved. 
all of those things um, are, each individual thing is something that's easily measurable. But drawing it back to trust or to psychological safety or whatever way you want to look at it or engagement is, is really cool and really radically different. Um, so maybe tell me a little bit about, like you use um, your, uh, as, as your company Immersion, you have an, a new app that you guys are, forgive me for calling it new, because I know it's it's not like, it's new to me. <laughs> but um, But talk to me a little bit about how you're using the app to help you measure these things and to prove this link between high trust, high trust, higher performance and better health in your people and low trust being lower performance, increased absenteeism and, and more problems. Yeah. yeah um, thank you, Neil. And I totally agree with the goals and the coaching and habit change is hard, metabolically hard. We, we, we get used to doing something. It's easy and it takes effort. And so that's, again, where measurement comes in. So um, try to unpack a couple of things. One is there are lots of aspects of culture. Culture is multidimensional. Um, the work I did in the late 90s, early 2000s asked which aspects of culture provide the biggest lever to improving performance. And we found trust was that in multiple published studies, you can find them all. Just Google my name. Um, so great. So trust is important. Um, where does trust come from? That's the oxytocin in this larger network it activates, which I've called immersion. Um, in fact, there's my, here's my, my real-time connection to you. You can see it's big smile. I'm getting a lot of value from this. Um, and so my background is I, I'm in summer. I'm psychologically safe. So, so if you can measure these things, then because trust is outside of our conscious awareness, it's a feeling state uh, asking you, how much do I trust you, Neil? How much do I trust my organization? It, it's just poorly anchored compared to what? On a one to seven scale, well, what, what is seven? Is that my kids? Is that my wife? My wife may have tried to murder me once and once or twice. I'm not sure. You know, she's Italian. You never know. So, you know, it's, it's just un... Uh, it's, with cause. <laughs> probably with cause, yeah. So, again, it's unanchored. But brain activity, the firing of neurons, is the common currency of value across domains. And so once I can capture that neural firing, then I have an objective measure comparable across individuals that allows me as a leader to ask, am I creating an environment in which people can really flourish in the broad sense, as you said, not only at work professionally, but personally, and even spiritually, whatever that means to people outside of work and family, what makes you feel like you're an important part of the planet? What's creating value for the people around you that you care about? So if one of those three dimensions, personal, professional, spiritual, is in decline, people are not going to perform well at work. And so that's where this work-life integration, having flexibility when and where you work is important. Even though I said, I think people should be in the office at least a couple of days a week. And then making sure that people have time for themselves so that they're getting outside of work and family, which are kind of obligations, getting a sense of doing something valuable. So for me, every weekend I go out um, and with my dog out in the country and we go hike and we go in the hills and we, I don't listen to music. I go out and I just immerse myself in that environment so that I can think, I can do things. And then investing obviously in relationships and, and uh, recreational time. So that's kind of my, if you will, spiritual practice where I'm out there alone, um, sometimes in dicey areas, you know, all by myself, no cell service and have to kind of be present, have to be fully aware of the environment. And when I don't get that time, then I just feel I get sluggish. Like when we don't work out, you know, you get sluggish. So again, from a leadership lesson perspective, the office should be a social emotional hub, give people enough autonomy where they have some flexibility and high locus of control. And think about, you know, besides working family, making sure that people have something else that's fulfilling that gives them energy because the energy you get from your personal life and your, what I, I don't, I'm using spiritual and close because I don't have a better word for that. Your transcendent practice, whatever mm -hmm. makes you feel alive and energized, you bring that to work. Right. So that's the thing. I want to think of this whole person. And the nice thing about measuring brain activity at scale is I get a whole person objective measure. Right. Now, again, th these data are anonymized. I showed you my data, but this is going to a platform that is anonymizing all that data. So I don't know that it's Sue that is, you know, down in this in the dumps, but I can send an, anon an anonymous message saying, hey, whoever you are, employee, um, you know, we have resources. You can, um, 
take some time off and talk to a therapist. Uh, you can use our meditation app we just bought. Um, you know, talk to your supervisor about having some flex time, right? So we can guide employees towards greater fulfillment so that they who are creating value for our customers, right, frontline employees in particular, that they can really get the satisfaction from doing that. So again, I'm not, I'm gonna be really clear. It's not about squeezing more out of each employee. It's about giving the, the opportunity for that employee to really flourish, which helps the employee feel great about himself or herself, but also create great value for that employee's team, the whole organization. And as you said, in our published research for society as a whole, if I'm coming out of work and feeling like, man, we nailed the day. We did something hard, but important. Our clients are happy. We're earning a profit, right? This is exciting. I come home. I'm a much nicer, uh, you know, spouse. I'm a much, much better father. You know, I'm, I'm really doing, I feel like I'm on top of the world. And so I get to share that with the people around me. That's that nice positive feedback loop that trust creates. It, yeah, for sure. And it's, it's particularly relevant and, and particularly important right now because, you know, we're in a society that's so divisive and so much of the messaging around us is negative. And, you know, I mean, y you guys are facing into a presidential election at the moment. And it seems to me right now from the outside looking in and, you know, I've lived over there. I, 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 I love it over there. Um, but I feel like the messaging is all about what's wrong with the other guy and not about how I'm going to fix your country or I'm going to do the good things. And there's so much n nasty stuff going on in the world right now. And the idea that you can go to work and actually have a good connection, a good experience and come home happy, I think, I think is hugely important because it hasn't always been the way, right? But one thing I'm particularly interested in, and it's, I suppose, off the back of the pandemic and, you know, we, we're, we're, we're a couple of years coming out the other side now of, of a really bleak time in our history. But the fact that remote working is here to stay and probably the single biggest challenge for organizations in building connection, let alone building trust, is the fact that, you know, a lot of our workforce are working remotely. Um, now, I'm not going to lie, and it's probably part of my kind of social anxiety or whatever, but I quite like the idea of working from home and not being in an office. Um, I love being in a coffee shop and I like meeting, I like meeting people out for meetings rather than in an office. I just, an office environment doesn't, has never really appealed to me. It's just me personally, but I agree with you that, you know, we need proximity in order for us to connect. So, I mean, having days in the office is a very positive thing, but, but from your perspective with the the kind of concepts that you're working on and what you're seeing, because you work for some, like Emergent is involved with some really big organizations who have huge challenges across, you know, various countries in relation to how they keep their people connected. Um, what do you see as being the, the tips or the solutions for companies in helping to build trust in a remote environment? Yeah, a couple of things. One is, you know, as I said earlier, you make time for that um, small talk. We call it small talk, but it's really big talk, right? It's really valuable for that, building that relationship, number one. From a leadership perspective, um, if, you, if you're if you a fully remote uh, company, then um, once a month, you need to see at least all those people either individually or as a group. So it could be uh, convenient, uh, an offsite at a co-working spot. Hey, we're, we work all over Dublin, but we're all gonna come into this one day together. Um, so much more is done when we're actually interacting. So I, I agree with you, Neil. I like working at home. I got my uh, pajamas on. I'm really comfortable. So it's really nice for me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, last week I was with half my team and gosh, did we have fun. And we just nailed problems that we've been struggling with for a couple months, you know, uh, a full day together. And we made enormous progress. So just because I can't wear my pajamas when I'm, when I'm out in public um, doesn't mean that I shouldn't, you know, actually have those meetings. Um, and then third is, you know, again, think about, you know, cheating a little bit. So um, bribe people to, to get together. You know, the Google, you know, free lunch thing. Every time I've been at Google, which is, a, I don't know, 10 times uh, different locations, 
there's, you know, I'm giving a talk, there's a lunch and all kinds of, because they have these long picnic table kind of things. And all of a sudden people go, oh, you're in that uh, machine learning group. Oh, I heard about that. What are you guys working on? So employees who don't know each other all of a sudden have this shared uh, focus because they're all kind of working in, you know, different parts of Google, but they don't know each other. And so that's one of the values of being together. So um, make time uh, either on Zoom or in person, have that small talk. Number one, get together at least once a month. Um, at a minimum. And that can, again, could be that um, uh, leader flying around to meet people or convening people together. Um, and then third, think about food or other um, activities that can form bonding relationships. So when we look at the, the neuroscience of trust, um, things like eating, things like moving together, exercising, taking a hike, those all facilitate oxytocin release and help build those relationships across individuals. And you, you said in your opening, Neil, it, it is all about relationships, right? So it's not this top down, I'm the general, damn it, you do what I say. That's that, that role is long gone. We're much in a, we're all working together, great transparency, share information. And last thing, you know, share the why. If you're a leader, um, we're really good at the what's, but we're not as good as the why. So when we look at you know research from my lab and others, when you tell people why they're doing something, why it matters, they put a lot more effort in. And again, this is unconscious. We have we, experiments where we just barely tell you why this thing is valuable to someone besides you earning a salary. I mean, like twice as much productivity. So share that why, right? Be a good listener, um, absorb information, make a decision, but say, hey, I listened to you guys. We're thinking about changing direction for something we do. And here's what we're going to do. Let me tell you why we're doing it. Oh, gosh. Okay, now I'm on board. And I'm not just getting a directive. We have to do this thing. I'm getting like, hey, I listen to a lot of people. I listen to our customers, listen to employees. You guys are great to share your views with me. And here's what we've decided to do. But let me t explain why we're doing this. Well, now I'm on board, right? It's not just like you must do this, right? <laughs> so, again, these are adults. They put their pants on in the morning. They had breakfast. They showed up on time. Um don't treat them like children, right? They're adults. They have their own uh, brains and motivations Absolutely. and use that, right? And that's, it's just a powerful effect where I get you to have that emotional buy-in. And that's exactly what we're measuring with our technology. Are you emotionally bought in or not? If you are, man, you're going to rock and roll. It's going to be fun. And that takes us, I'm very conscious of, uh, I know how valuable your time is and I'm very conscious of how much of it I've taken up here. Um, so tell me or, or tell the listener a little bit about, uh, your Tuesday app. Um, I've got my my Whoop that's connected to it. Um, may, maybe kind of just uh, take 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 a couple of minutes to do a whole promo reel and sell your. How app. nice of you! Uh, Where can they get it and what can they get from it? Yeah. So uh, currently, um, uh, for Apple only, we're building the Android version now. Version two will come out in a couple of months. Uh, so this is uh, January twenty twenty four. So by March twenty twenty four, you'll have. Version two, which is both Android and, and uh, Apple, it's free for users, right? Because we believe that building emotional fitness is the most important thing people can do in the world, right? If we're not emotionally fit, if we if you can't take care of yourself and the people around you, you're not going to be successful. Um, businesses play pay for a platform to see anonymized data from their organizations. Um, it um, is gamified and AI enabled, so it learns about you. So just like we have steps as a nice measure of physical fitness emotional fitness has a ring to close every day so that you can build up your emotional fitness you can build up the value of those social emotional experiences so that when life inevitably kicks you in the gut you've got enough uh, you know um, slack in the system you've got enough people you can call you have built up the sense of good sense of self where you're not kind of knocked down into depression so uh, currently being used in corporate wellness programs, uh, by health insurers, um, uh, by clinicians. And so it's really exciting to have a proactive tool to have better mental health. And it turns out that people who are emotionally fit live longer, get sick less often, are happier and healthier. So uh, again, that's why I'm so passionate about this, Neil. And thank you so much for letting me do a little promo. So um, it's best Tuesday ever is the website. No, not at all. And I, I, I just, just to reinforce that, Paul, the best Tuesday ever. And uh, I just to reinforce that message. I mean, 2023 was a very difficult year for me personally, and there were some challenges uh, that uh, 
were hard to kind of cope with on my own, but but the app actually was a really useful tool in helping me navigate my way out of it and seeing my way into a really positive 2024. So, um, you know, thank you for developing it. And I absolutely wholeheartedly endorse it without having any money or any skin in the game. <laughs> I am. <laughs> But uh, but no, it, it's a great tool and I, I recommend people to use it. Paul, thanks so much, as always, for the chat. Never dull. Um, I I think um, my colleagues here, uh, this, this, this show is produced by a, a content creation company called Loki, who are absolutely fabulous. And I'm pretty sure they're going to want to talk to you about doing work with them because your stuff is always gold and I just love it. Um, have a, have a, have a great, uh, rest of your day, rest of your week. And, uh, I will, I will talk to you soon. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for the privilege of spending time with you. 